And now speaking of uh, another another incident of compounding felonies to coerce a settlement, it, and it is one that disappointed me. I, like I say, it's not my decision to make. It's not my pressure to live under. But I feel it sets a very bad precedent for everybody involved. But skis. And for anybody who doesn't know the 30,000 foot overview, go watch the videos. But I've done a number of vlogs on it. They were the ones who gar uh, garnished, who uh, brandished firearms at a group of BLM protesters who broke through a private gate. That wasn't disclosed at the time. They were just peacefully walking, according to some. But then the evidence came out that they broke through a private gate onto a private street on a very wealthy, affluent, private neighborhood looking for the mayor's house. Mark and Patricia Mulkowski came out, one with a big gun and the other one with a little gun, pointed at the crowd. Crowd dispersed or walked past. They were indicted on, uh, I think it was felony gun charges of brandishing a firearm, displaying a firearm in an, in a, an aggressive or intimidating manner, whatever, subsection four of that, of that provision. In the context of that prosecution, uh, Kim Gardner, the circuit attorney who's prosecuting, used that case to raise money for her re-election. The investigator disassembled the pistol, reassembled it so that it was functional, so they could charge Patricia McCloskey. Kim Gardner was subsequently taken off the case in a decision which she tried to appeal, but was confirmed on appeal. She was removed. Special prosecutor was appointed. Everything looked like it was going the way of pure vindication, possibly with a case for malicious prosecution. And what does Mark and Patricia McCloskey do last week? They plead guilty to a misdemeanor gun charge of, I didn't really understand it, it's pointing, you know, causing discomfort by pointing a gun or something along those lines. Uh, I was flabbergasted only because of the reputation of Mark McCloskey, who apparently, from the internet world, has a reputation of being highly litigious, potentially unpleasant neighbor for those reasons. Uh, he's running for Senate, so that might have come into play, but he pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor and says it's a victory because we just have to pay a fine forfeit those two particular firearms, um, and, and then we can go on with our day. What's your, I mean, I, my, my take, I don't know how to materialize it. I don't know how to describe it or what the alternatives could be. I feel there's something more going on in the background that we don't know, but I don't know what that could be. I would say, but for their political aspirations, that their decision is a decision that most people would make. And like the like I, I was talking with someone last week about the uh, Amy Cooper case and they were like, well, well, you know, why not go forward with the trial and everything else? And I'm like, I got a complete dismissal with prejudice in a case that was being led by three investigators who are the, are the cold case division of the New York Police Department. Three of the greatest, three of the toughest investigators in the world. The prosecutor who just put Harvey Weinstein in prison for life, basically one of the top toughest prosecutors in the country. In a New York criminal court system where the local city court judges are appointed by the mayor who's publicly attacked my client in a New York Manhattan jury pool, that is going to be a lynching kind of jury pool for a case like this, the wanting to virtue signal to the world. And I got complete dismissal with prejudice, with no plea deal of nothing, no diversion, no nothing. And the uh, but I, uh, it's under the underappreciated that kind of outcome because people don't understand how often. Most people will plead to even something they didn't do to avoid the worst consequences when they have the guillotine right at the back of their neck. And the problem that McCloskey's faced is they have a, still a St. Louis jury pool. It's going to be a Democratic liberal leaning jury pool. They have a judge that might be decent, but not likely to be spectacular, given again, it's, it comes from a Democratic constituency. Um, and so you, you, you have to face that reality, and there's at least a risk of conviction. And if you're convicted on the felonies, you might have the governor pardon you as he's promised to do, but he'll need to still be governor when that occurs. No guarantee that that takes okay. place. So stop right there. That was one hypothesis. Someone said they were gonna, they're going to get a pardon, which didn't make sense to me. But when could the governor issue the pardon? Is it like president up until his last day or is it up until the day he is uh, beaten in an election? No, uh, it, it would be up to his last day. However, in Missouri, there's no preemptive pardons, unlike, unlike the U.S. government. So he can only pardon post conviction. That's why he hadn't pardoned yet. Okay. Um, so the so the there's a bit of a gamble for them that they're maybe they're not convicted until after he's out of office. Now he's probably going to get reelected, but again, you I mean that's it's a risk you have to put on there. It's because they're lawyers that they understand these risks very well. They understand. But could could they not if he doesn't get reelected? Could they not have pleaded then, or would that offer not necessarily have been on the table then? Right. It, it, that's absolutely the case. It, it would the that offer may have been quickly revoked. So you know, a special prosecutor had been assigned the case. But usually what their job is to do in a case like this is to cover their path. 
They do not want to confess and admit. I've had a bunch of cases where I've got, like the Cooper case, complete dismissals. But those are extremely rare. That requires you have to turn up the pressure so hot that the that they think their only solution is to get out of the room. Uh, most of the time they look at this as they want a plea to something to cover everything their, their fellow prosecutors did, uh, that their fellow policemen did, or grand jury in some cases did. That's their instinct. They almost never want to capitulate by giving a straight dismissal. They hate, hate, hate doing that. And, and usually there's something behind the scenes when that happens. So the, uh, so here, I think they were just, it, it may be the case that they saw their trial exposure based on facts we don't know. But I don't think that, the only reason to think that is this is a very logical decision to make, except for the fact that he has political ambitions. However, it may be the case he was using his political ambitions to pressure the prosecution rather than actually be because he hadn't shown much political aspirations before this case. So a smart lawyer might use and say, you know, I'm going to run for the Senate on this case. And yes, I'm going to make sure there's a lot of attention brought to this case. So think long and hard about how you're going to do this. And it may be the case that he doesn't pursue that much. That will it will tell you where he is six months from now will tell you how much he was just using a smart legal strategy rather than really wanting to pursue uh, politics, because you're right, that's where this damages him the most. Because he pled, there'll be a, a depressing effect on his potential vote. But to be honest with you, knowing who else was running, he was highly unlikely to win. So that's where I, I suspect, and again, it'd just be a smart legal move, to he was using political uh, public uh, uh, office as a way to leverage this deal, which was for him a very good deal. These are minor misdemeanors, no effect on his bar license, no effect on his gun rights, uh, no real effect, anything. You pay it's a small, tiny fine and you're completely out of this. You have no you're, you're out. And the, the other side, what they want out of this is to save face. So like I told people in the Snipes case, the only upside to uh, them doing a compromise verdict, nine of them wanted straight acquittals, three wanted some convictions. So they gave him a few misdemeanors was if he'd got all acquittals, they would have come back after him again somehow. Because that would have been too damaging to their public. And they've done this repeatedly in cases where somebody gets acquitted of something, they come back on them on something else. Just look at how they've treated Trump. They try to find this on him. So that doesn't work. Then they go to something else and they go to something else and they go to something else. And so uh, he, he would know that. So he would know that his case was so hot that he would that something that saved face for the prosecution means it's all done and he's clear. So he made the practically pragmatically sound decision. It's not necessarily it's not something that James O'Keefe would do, as James O'Keefe pointed out. His yep. great regret uh, is, is taking that plea deal. He will never bear false witness against himself. Well, that that answers and to make sure that that's clear for everyone, because that clarifies it for me is the offer that he got. This is like deal or no deal. Take the deal, pick another or no deal, pick another briefcase. Oh, what your briefcase is the the, the governor just got over you know beaten in an election and you know that your trial's not coming up before he's out of office well now your misdemeanor plea just went to a whatever you know a lesser felony so i now i totally understand that there's a part of me that thinks maybe if the political aspiration is in fact genuine that maybe maybe pleading guilty will he thinks will garner him some support with the political uh, other side I, I, I think he knows it hurts him he seems pretty sound, you know, uh, uh, you know, personal injury, you know, he's, he's not in the criminal defense space, but a pretty smart lawyer. And he's played this pretty well because a lot of other people would have been railroaded. And if, if I, if I were watching the Derek Chauvin trial, you know, obviously a very different case, but it has some constituent components of it. For example, you have people like Tim pool predicted there's no chance for Kyle Rittenhouse. Now that, that case is going to be different uh, because I have a personal say in how it's going to be different, but I understand that reaction. The reaction to the Chauvin verdict is, wow, nothing's going to matter. They're just going to railroad anyone if it. And the problem is the jury pool. The St. Louis jury pool would not have been a favorable jury pool for them. So the the and the, what they gave the special prosecutor was a way to say face to say, look, hey, I got convictions that they admit they did wrong. Got him to forfeit the guns. I got what I needed for political cover without any risk. He gets to pay a small fine, pay no, and serve no time, doesn't have any risk with his law license doesn't have any risk with gun ownership. It, it, it's a win-win situation. It's it's unfair to have to be in that situation, but it's what you face when you're facing a criminal pro the power of criminal prosecutors. It's it's shocking to me how 
It, it, everything was shocking how not only was this happening, but Kim Gardner was uh, effectively escaping any sort of reprimand or repercussions. She's getting her comeuppance in another case. We'll see where that goes. But I, I was flabbergasted when they pleaded guilty. Uh, the, you know, McCloskey's tweets were sort of that trying to save face, but you know, you can't save face in that stage. But now I very much understand. I understand the plea deal given the politics because yeah, I, I took for granted that that deal would always be, you know, be on the table for long enough for the pardon to always be in play, but no. And that changes a lot, and, especially with his law license. Because apparently, tell me if this is right. It was in a CBC Associated Press article, pleading guilty to a misdemeanor. He does not run the risk of losing his law license, but a felony and, he does. Yeah, almost none. I mean, if he gets a felony, it's a major problem. Misdemeanor, there's always risk with misdemeanor, but very, very, very low risk. Um, and so the uh, so given that, uh, whereas a, and here's the other problem. Uh, uh, Rick, uh, Nick Ricardo also did a good uh, broadcast on this as well. And the is that even a pardon doesn't necessarily solve his gun issues or solve his bar licensure issues. He could still be disbarred based on the factual findings of the jury, despite the pardon, and he could still lose his gun rights or it would take him years to get him restored, even with a pardon. So that's why a pardon only prevented uh, criminal punishment. It didn't necessarily solve his other issues that he might face. Uh, and John Doback asks, would you, Viva or Barnes, say justice was done? Oh, uh, no. You? He never should have been charged. Never should have been a disgrace that he was ever charged. And and the whole, everything about it was a disgrace. But it tells you how even special prosecutors work. They think, how do I save face, not how do I get justice? No, and and, and seeing insights, seeing sights says, don't forget that Kim Gardner got financial backing from Soros. This is not a controversial or discriminatory thing to say, people. This is now recognized fact. Yeah. Um and uh, McCloskey was playing it hard on Twitter afterwards. And that, that might, you know, salvage some points, but I think a lot of people feel miffed, but I think I look, I felt, I didn't feel personally miffed. I just was shocked. I understand it now. And I think anybody who watches this segment will be more forgiving on McCloskey's decision than I was inclined to be before we did this. But uh, you know what? And it, good segue. Never bear, never bear false witness on thyself, which was James O'Keefe's only regret. He said, if he could even say it like that, which was when he pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor. Where was it? Was it in Louisiana, right? Oh, yeah. Eastern District of Louisiana. 